evening, everybody. So today we're going to be talking about macro neuroscience. Some of you might be wondering why I'm going to talk about macro neuroscience, and this is a neurotech course, which I'm very happy. So I have a question for you first before we go into that. So discuss with your groups for about 30 seconds of what you think the future of neurotech entails. sophisticated invasive neurotechnology. Okay. To lead to different sorts of uh, I mean like reading and writing from the brain essentially, but directly right. instead of outside. being able to understand the brain on a deeper level. Can we all agree on that? Yeah. Okay. So my follow-up question is why study neuroscience? How does this pertain to neurotech? Go ahead and discuss that for about 30 seconds. <laughs> Exactly how we think of the brain with neurotech. 
need to understand the brain on a fundamental and anatomical level before we can manipulate the brain. So it is argued that the brain could be the most important organ, but it's also the most complicated. We really don't know much about it, as Devin said last week. So here we're going to talk about a field that we do know a little more about than the actual technology standpoint, but the anatomy, because we are working on mapping the brain. So here are just some fast facts about the brain. It weighs three pounds, it consumes about 20% of your body energy. It has about 100 billion neurons and 100,000 miles of blood vessels. So here's just an image of the brain so you can visualize what it looks like if we cut it down the middle. So I'll be pointing out these structures later, but pay attention to the diagram on the right, which is the reptilian paleomammalian and neomammalian brain. So we'll be starting with the smallest level and building outward. So we'll start with the reptilian brain. So if anyone has ever dissected a reptile, they can see that their brain looks something like that, um, which consists of the midbrain, cerebellum, pons, and medulla oblongata. So this is the oldest brain and controls our vital functions. So we'll start with the medulla oblongata. So it controls respiration and circulation, so your heartbeat and your breathing. And it also is responsible for defense mechanism, so vomiting when you eat something that's toxic to your body. And in the image on the right, you can see that it's almost the lowest part of the brain stem. Next we have the pons, which is responsible for communication and sensation. So processes such as sleep, posture, and facial expression. And it also relays signals from your forebrain to the cerebellum. So it's kind of a communicator in that sense. <coughs> I'll move on to the midbrain, which is responsible for motor movement and processing and includes functions such as vision, hearing, motor control, alertness, and temperature control. And at this point, I want to emphasize that no one of these structures is responsible for exactly one function. Multiple of these structures work together to do many things, but we do focus on their main function. So while I am listing these functions, it's not exclusive. We have the cerebellum, which is responsible for coordination and movement and also controls forms of speech and relays more information from the spinal cord to the rest of your brain. Any questions so far? All right, we'll move on to the limbic system. So the limbic system consists of the paleomammalian brain. And while it is dis debated on what constitutes the limbic system, we do include <coughs> the outer cortex, cerebellum. Well, the cerebellum brain stem are part of the reptilian brain. But we are discussing now the cerebral cortex. And this is responsible for subconscious emotion. And the structures are the amygdala, hippocampus, <coughs> hypothalamus, and the thalamus. Okay, so now I have another question for you guys. How do you wake a heavy sleeper? You guys can just shout out answers. Slap. Slap, yeah. Slap them. Pour water on them, maybe? Tickle? Yeah. So, basically, you need to be as aggressive as possible. And the reason is, your thalamus goes to sleep when you go to sleep. And your thalamus is, control is in, uh, in charge of controlling your senses. So we need to wake up the thalamus. So whatever you're gonna do, scream, pour water on them, do something, because you need to wake the thalamus. There is one exception though. Does anyone know what sense of, what one of our senses we can use when we're asleep? Hearing. Hearing? I can't hear much when I'm asleep. Smell. Has anyone ever used sniffing salts? They wake you right up. 
Okay, so here we have the amygdala, and it is responsible for negative emotions. And the way I learned the amygdala was Amy G. Dalla is a bitch. So she really holds on to things. So there's two in your brain. There's one on the left and one on the right. And the one on the right is usually the one that's a bitch. And the one on the left is a little more balanced. We have the hippocampus, which is important for memory formation, and I will discuss how memories are formed later in this lecture. But we do see damage in this area in patients who suffer from Alzheimer's, which is a neurodegenerative disease that involves memory loss. And if you've ever learned about rats being able for mice, being able to learn their way through um, a maze, learn the path, and remember it, so memorize it, they're using the hippocampus. And we've been able to do this by doing brain scans and seeing that the neurons in the hippocampus are firing during this process. Okay. So I have a little video for to show you. Patients, based on the notion that mental functions were strictly localized to corresponding brain areas. Having successfully used them to reduce seizures in psychotics, Scoville decided to remove HM's hippocampus, a part of the limbic system that was associated with emotion, but whose function was unknown. At first glance, the operation had succeeded. HM's seizures virtually disappeared, with no change in personality, and his IQ even improved. But there was one problem. His memory was shot. Besides losing most of his memories from the previous decade, HM was unable to form new ones, forgetting what day it was, repeating comments, and even eating multiple meals in a row. When Scoville informed another expert, Wilder Penfield, of the results, he sent a PhD student named Brenda Milner to study HM at his parents' home, where he now spent his days doing odd chores and watching classic movies for the first time, over and over. What she discovered through a series of tests and interviews didn't just contribute greatly to the study of memory, it redefined what memory even meant. One of Milner's findings shed light on the obvious fact that although HM couldn't form new memories, he still retained information long enough from moment to moment to finish a sentence or find the bathroom. When Milner gave him a random number, he managed to remember it for 15 minutes by repeating it to himself constantly. But only five minutes later, he forgot the test had even taken place. Neuroscientists had thought of memory as monolithic, all of it essentially the same, and stored. <coughs> evolved to more complex functions, the limbic system is still fairly primitive. And the way that it works is more of a stimulus response type of thing. And many of you may experience this firsthand, but it's really hard to pay attention when something is, is occupying your limbic system. So emotions play into our lives very, very much so. So we see here that the amygdala is responsible for traumatic events and our fight and flight response, which is a very primitive function. And then we have our hypothalamus, which is more related to uh, our heart rate and vital functions. So if someone gets really, really nervous, like me before it's lecture, the heart rate's gonna speed up. And that's responsible to the limbic system. Okay, so now we will talk about the neomammalian brain which is the cerebral cortex. So basically just the outer part of our brains. And it can constitutes four lobes, parietal, frontal, occipital, and temporal. And it is responsible for processing sensation and a lot of higher order processes like thinking, planning, and decision making. So within each lobe, 
of the four in the cerebral cortex. There are areas which process sensory information and then relay those signals to sensory and motor areas, and we call these association areas. So before I dive deep into the neomammalian brain, I'm gonna go over some whole brain concepts. The first one is brain plasticity. So we see here that brain plasticity is the measure of how much our brain can change. So how many people learned a language other than like English? Yeah, awesome. Thankful for brain plasticity. So our brains are very, very plastic when we're young, which is why we're, it's easy to pick up languages if they're spoken in the household. But then as over time, the plasticity decreases as your brain develops. And if you're not practicing that language over and over again, you're gonna lose it. So there are advantages, like repairing damages. If there's a part of the brain that's been damaged, we can use some sort of therapy such as ECT, which is electroconvulsive therapy, to stimulate that part of the brain and try to get connections firing again. But there is the downside that you can lose certain functions that you're just simply not using. You're not allowing your brain to fire connections, make connections between these two things, and your brain simply thinks, oh, I don't need this anymore, I'll get rid of it. And there's this point I wanna make that there are a lot of connections happening in our brain and that can cause noise. And that comes up later when we're discussing uh, neurotech devices. So how useful is brain plasticity, plasticity in the first place? Well, on top of as we're developing, we need our brains to be plastic in order to adapt to our surroundings. We want the brain to be able to rearrange and form these synaptic connections. You don't want to remember every single thing that you've seen or learned because that's simply not important to you. So this idea that our brains can change as we change is really important to us as humans and working efficiently. So, this, like, this concept of um, experiencing a stroke, does anyone know what that is, or can you find it for me? Yeah. Like, the lack of fertility in the brain, so right. tissue dies. Tissue dies. That's not good. So, in order to recover from stroke, there are applications of brain plasticity that we can use. But first I wanna talk about this idea of long-term potentiation. So it's the strengthening of synapses based off of recent activity and experiences. So there's an increase in signal transmission. And we use this process a lot during neural networks. Because we see things, we learn things, and then we use what we know to judge those future things, which is a key idea to how neural networks work. Okay, so here comes this idea that there's long-term potentiation, long-term depression, and then homeostatic plasticity. So long-term potentiation is learning things and retaining them for a long time and being able to use them to what we come across. Long-term depression is much the opposite. And so because these produce opposite effects on synaptic excitability, there is this balance in between that we call homeostatic plasticity. And these forms of plasticity are considered cellular processes involved in learning and memory. So this idea that we can see something, learn something, and then apply it is a key component of how memory and learning work for humans. So how is this applicable? Well, we can use brain remapping, which is basically what it sounds like. Uh, but to do so, we must retrain the way our brain has been wired, which is a little tricky. So 
I brought up a stroke earlier because this happens to stroke patients. They lose oxygen to a part of their brain and those brain cells die, and we somehow need to create connections where those once were but now lost. So we use certain technologies to stimulate that part of the brain and hopefully rewire it and create those connections. So there's this idea that if there's a paralyzed limb, for example, from a stroke, we can place this mirror and if I move my right hand and I'm looking in the mirror, it looks like my left hand is moving too. And with time, our brain will start to think, oh, I can move my left hand. And eventually I'll be able to actually move my left hand because we're tricking the brain into thinking that there is motor function or motor function is now lost. So I'll show you this video clip of the mirror ball. The patient understands that they have to look at the reflection. Um, the thing that's great about mirror therapy, something like that, with the mirror box, um, is just as long as the patient understands what he or she needs to do, and that they could follow through and carry over, is that uh, they could actually, I could give this mirror box, I could lend it to them, they could take it to their room, Show you some things. I just want you to tell me what you see. And here we go. 
Everything to the right of the point goes to his left brain, the dominant hemisphere for language and speech. So we can see here that when we flash a word or a picture, the joke is easily able to name it. Close your eyes and let your left hand do a little work here. So he said he couldn't see it. Okay, what do you got there? Okay, very good. But he's able to draw the picture. Now, when a word or a picture falls to the left of a fixation point, that information goes to his disconnected right half brain. And as we can see here, Joe is unable to name it. But Joe is able to draw the picture with his left hand. The left. Hand. So what I was just trying to show you is that there's different forms of recall depending on which side of the brain you're using. Okay. So now I'll get back to what I was talking about earlier, which are four main lobes. So we'll start with the frontal lobe. So does anyone know what this is responsible for? Just shout it out, any guesses? Personality, yeah. Not exactly. Executive function? Yes. Higher order processes. <coughs> So thinking, planning, decision making, motivation, all that good stuff. So um, we have the prefrontal cortex inside the frontal lobe, as well as the motor cortex, which lines the very back of our frontal lobe. Okay, what about the parietal lobe? Any guesses? Sensation. Sensation, also. So, processing our senses. Spatial sense, a little bit of language processing. But it's mainly filled with sensory and association areas. Remember what association areas do. Okay, so they pick up information from one part and relate it to some other cortex. So in, in this case, it's the somatosensory cortex. And they're picking up information from our visual people. How about the temporal lobe? Think about where it is in relation to. Hearing, yes. Auditory perception. So it's made known for processing information from other areas of the brain and parts of our limbic system. And inside of the temporal lobe, we have an area called Wernicke's area, which I'll go into a little bit later. How about the occipital lobe? Vision. Vision. It really only does one thing. But as I mentioned earlier, the information from the right eye is going to the left part of our lobe and the left eye to the right. And we call that contralaterally. So here's just an image to put all of this together. And remember that no one lobe is working at one time. Everything works together to perform these functions. They're just localized to specific areas. Okay, here's another question. So go ahead and discuss this for a little bit. With your groups. Yeah. 
these are pretty simple functions. I'll show you what happens to these patients with damage to each function. Now tell me what this thing was with your legs last week or week before. Uh, no good. Uh, <coughs> uh, age and Idea that 
memory is stored as strengths of synaptic connections in neural circuits. And that learning alters the ways of these synaptic connections based on our experiences. <coughs> So we can change the strength. So how well you remember something depends on how strong these synaptic connections can be. So we can change the strength by introducing this idea again and again and again, creating more connections, and then we'll be better able to remember and recall this. Failure to do so leads into Alzheimer's disease, which I mentioned earlier. So it affects memory, and to be honest, we don't really know what the cause is or how to prevent Alzheimer's. We do see some common things, that there's this plaque of protein buildup in the brain, so we're starting to connect that idea. But it does start, this protein buildup starts in the hippocampus and spreads throughout the brain. And we know that it leads to memory loss, but that's about it. Some philosophy. This is what's up. As the tale goes, Theseus, the mythical founder king of Athens, single-handedly slayed the evil Minotaur at Crete, then returned home on a ship. To honor this heroic feat, for 1,000 years, Athenians painstakingly maintained his ship in the harbor and annually reenacted his voyage. Whenever a part of the ship was worn or damaged, it was replaced with an identical piece of the same material, until at some point, no original parts remained. Okay, so that's just a little introduction of what I'm going to talk about, which is philosophy of mind. But I'll start with this um, idea of who am I, who are you? each individual person, how can we really identify such? So there is this paradox of identity. So we have our first ship here, docked in Athens, and then we have the ship a thousand years later which has been prepared. My question to you is, are these two the same thing? Go ahead and discuss with your groups. Stances on this problem. 
We formulate theories, we discuss them, we revise them. So if anybody's taken some sort of philosophy of mind class, they've learned about this mind-body problem, which is mainly, can mind and body be considered distinct entities based on the premise that the mind and the body are fundamentally different in nature? So it's weird to think of your brain and your mind as maybe two separate things, maybe working together, Maybe there's some third mysterious substance that connects these two. So that's what philosophy of mind is focusing on. How do we view the human body and our minds? So Rene Descartes came up with some theories and he called it dualism. So we call it Cartesian dualism. And he's saying that there is some distinction between the physical and material realms. I mean material and mental realms. Um, that our brains and our bodies can be two different things and work together. And then there's this other theory, which is much the opposite. That mind and matter are the same thing and must work together, must coexist. So here in this diagram, we see dualism on the left and monism on the right. And within monism, there's three main perspectives. We have physicalism, idealism, and natural law. So physicalism, matter overcomes mind. Matter controls, everything can be broken down to a physical basis. Idealism, vice versa, so everything can come down to a mental basis. And then neutral monism, which is this weird third mysterious substance which actually controls both of them. So now I come to this idea of consciousness and how we can understand what makes a human being conscious. So how many of you have seen this? <coughs> yeah. Cogito ergo sum. Translated, I think, therefore I am. Do you think that that is enough to declare consciousness, that we are conscious beings? Simply saying, I think, therefore I am. When Descartes quoted this, it was accepted. People thought, yeah, that's a good way to see consciousness. But now we speculate, how can we define this idea of consciousness? What makes a human being conscious? Why am I even telling you this? Why do we care about consciousness in an intro to neurotech class? Can anyone answer that question for me? Okay, I mean, maybe we don't, but we do. Uh, when we're building systems, artificial intelligence systems, we want to understand if we can exactly replicate the human brain, because that is the goal here. We want to understand the human brain on a deeper level. But can we replicate consciousness? Is there a way for us to make computers conscious beings? But we don't even know what consciousness is, so that's why I bring this to your attention. Is how can we understand ourselves in order to model ourselves? And that's what Narotech is trying to do. Okay. 